Discerners live experience at HEMS 2019 in Orlando, Florida. We are streaming live today from the Cerner Recording Studio on the HIMSS exhibit floor where we're sharing unique and insightful perspectives from some of the brightest minds in healthcare. At Cerner, we are intent on becoming the partner of choice for innovation in healthcare, but innovation only happens through collaboration. We are at a place of immense opportunity and possibility in this industry, but our next chapter collectively can only be as powerful as the collaborative relationships that we cultivate. Today, we're discussing what some are calling an epidemic, physician burnout, and what we can do collectively to solve it. We're joined in the studio by Dr. Jigar Patel, Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the Physician Alignment Organization, and David Cohen, Vice President of IP at Cerner. Dr. Patel, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Brooke. So physician burnout is a top priority for the industry and for Cerner. Uh, recently, Medscape published a report stating that 42% of physicians experienced symptoms of burnout and 15% of physicians reported feeling some sort of depression. Those are pretty staggering statistics yeah. here. Um, Dr. P Patel, I'm wondering, just to start off with you, in your professional opinion, why is physician burnout steadily rising, rising and how is physician burnout affecting patient care? Yeah, I thought I'd take a second and talk about some of the, there, there's a lot of research that's been done on, on burnout in general, but specifically physician burnout. And um, one of the burnout surveys that's used uh, commonly is from Maslach. And it basically takes you through three different elements. First is an emotional exhaustion, so that you actually um, feel emotionally exhausted. And that's also that's related to uh, how hard it is to do your job, um, just uh, the strain of doing the job. We're in a, you know, an emotional environment with our patients all the time, so that, that makes it very hard also. Um, and that, it, it, they classify that as kind of the individual uh, burnout. The second is depersonalization. So this is the doc in the box concept, mm -hmm. right? The doctor mm -hmm. is just the doctor. Um, that's very different than in, in the past. Um, and that's a interpersonal burnout. And then right. finally, um, a reduced sense of accomplishment. So you don't feel like you're uh, achieving something with the work mm -hmm. you're doing every day. So that's a kind of a self-evaluation. And all of those um, have various uh, elements that, that we see today. Um, as an example, like I said, the, from an emotional perspective, you feel depleted if you're working a shift. Um, those are long days. Right. Um, and you're seeing people that are in um, extremists and then their, their family relationships. And that, that's emotionally uh, withdrawn, uh, emotionally difficult to get through. Right. Um, but then the second one is important because there's a component of loss of idealism. And it's the you've become, um, in a physician world, you're not... You're still a physician, but you become, I have to see 30 patients today. And so it becomes a very regimented, got to get through the list mm -hmm. kind of thing, which is not what we go to medical school for. Right? Exactly. We go there for the for the altruism. We go there to help people. Um, and then we do make a decent living, obviously. Mm -hmm. But those sorts of things are, are harder. And then finally, the, the personal accomplishment. This is where we, I think, links most directly to EHRs, isn't uh, the blame and the loss of productivity mm -hmm. associated with uh, using the EHR. Now, the EHR itself has a, a number of factors pushing on it to force physicians to do more things uh, in them. So, um, it, it this is real. Um, we are um, the the epidemic is real, I think. And then it's uh, it's all those things put together. But it's a lot of factors. It's not just uh, the EHR that's, right. that's contributing to it. Right. So you did mention that the, the epidemic is yes. real. Yeah. David, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on that. Would you consider this an epidemic? Yeah, I think certainly there's thing, there's when we look at the amount of time that clinicians spend within the EMR, um, it's not proportional to the amount of time that they're spending doing direct patient care. And you know that likely contributes to some of the dissatisfaction we heard, you know, Jigger and I hear all the time that clinicians went into medicine because they want to care and treat for their patients, right, right. not necessarily spend their time, you know, um, documenting things in an EMR. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the opportunities for Cerner's to look at how we can, you know, give clinicians some of that time back right. to better manage and care for their patients. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about the relationship side of healthcare, which is physicians want to establish and have relationships with um, the patients that they're serving. So helping them to return back to that relationship mm -hmm. aspect of healthcare. Yeah, that's great. So just to kind of stay on, on your track here. So 
as we all know, an EHR that's only leveraged as a documentation tool, as you described, um, rather than an intelligent tool to assist physicians in providing patient care could contribute to physician burnout. I was wondering if you could kind of broadly discuss how Cerner's addressing this issue specifically and helping improve that physician usability of the EHR. And um, feel free to dive into specifics yeah. here. Okay. Um, so I don't think the EMR is only leveraged as a documentation tool today. So we should clarify that a little bit. We do have quite a few um, intelligent capabilities, particularly around you know, evidence-based clinical decision support in the EMR today that provides some level of intelligence. Um, I think you know, part of the challenge with evidence-based decision support is that, one, it takes a, lot, a long time for that type of intelligence to get to, um, to get to a state where it's in front of clinicians in terms of having to um, review clinical, publish clinical research, um, and then translate that into some EMR code to where we can, it can be valuable for, um, for clinicians. And what's exciting about the current era is that we're now starting to use more statistical methods like machine learning to actually analyze the data, um, the digitized data within the EMR to really shorten that that time span. The other thing about evidence-based decision support is that it's not highly tuned or localized for um, individual facilities, individual providers. And I think that's one of the really exciting things about um, data analytics and machine learning is that we can build N, N, you know, N plus one type of models that can be really more tuned um, and leveraged for specific providers and specific workflows. Um, you know, one of the one of the thoughts around the last the last decade almost, I would say Cerner and the industry as a whole, we've really been trying to catch up with, you know, keep up with regulatory um, requirements and meaningful use. And a lot of those mandates have been around, you know, quite honestly, what clinicians need to document, what they need to order, um, you know, patient, what patient education they need to place and doing that within the, within the boundaries of the EMR. Um, I think one of the you know maybe assumptions was that all of that had to happen through a mouse and a keyboard as an interface. Mm -hmm. And when we start to look at some capabilities that are emerging around AI, um, capabilities like voice you know voice detection, um, image recognition capabilities, we now start to see that there's things other than a mouse and keyboard that can start to be uh, an interface for clinicians. And I think that area is opening the door for a lot of really exciting possibilities. Great, thank you for those updates. So we, we know the healthcare environment can be demanding and um, take that emotional toll on physicians. Can you talk specifically how AI can help make the physician user experience easier and um, improve that patient care? Yeah, so you know, AI I would say is still is still emerging on the scene, but it's evolving really quickly. And, and you know, we're starting to see a number of um, companies that are really trying to go after the space, including Cerner, in terms of how we're looking at leveraging voice. So, for example, one of the exciting things that we're showing on um, on the HIMSS floor today is our um, proof of concept around virtual scribe. And what that really does is um, it it listens to conversations between a care provider and a patient. And from that conversation, we're able to extract key clinical concepts that a clinician otherwise would have had to turn to a mouse and keyboard to document. So one, we're taking away that redundantness to uh, a patient just said they have an allergy or they're on a med, mm -hmm. why can't we automatically chart that on behalf of the provider? And two, we're giving the relationship aspect back to, right. the, to that relationship so that a provider, you know, typically we see providers turning their back to patients to document. In this case, um, the provider and caregiver can really just focus on that interaction with the patient, knowing that technology is taking a lot uh, and doing a lot behind the scenes um, to document some of those requirements. And, you know, meaningful use, and I would say a lot of the focus for the last couple of years has really focused on the input side of the equation. So it's how are we getting data in? Um, you know, in terms of documentation, um, patient education, how are we getting data in, but not so much on how are we getting data out and returning to the provider, giving them the value that they're putting into the EMR. Right. So I think, you know, AI in general um, offers the opportunity 
to now start to return some value to um, to caregivers in terms of the output and the intelligence that we're pushing back to them. So one example is a is a uh, solution that we recently announced um, this week, which is our Chart Assist solution. Right. And Chart Assist is really looking at um, clinical uh, clinical documentation improvement, real time in the hands of providers while they're um, in the encounter and while they're documenting things for that patient. So we can present to clinicians opportunities. So if they document a particular diagnosis, for example, but they might have missed um, a treatment decision or, um, or that particular diagnosis isn't supported by clinical evidence, mm -hmm. so discrete evidence in the chart, we can per push that to the provider that they might want to revisit that diagnosis. And inversely to that, we can also propose diagnosis, diagnosis to providers. So if there's evidence and treatment in the chart for a particular diagnosis, we can suggest to a provider that they might want to investigate that further. So all these, all these things are opportunities in, wh in which now AI and machine learning are starting to create new intelligence and new insights to where we can um, push some of those insights to the caregiver um, and really help to reduce some of the cognitive load Right. If we think about the amount of um, amount of data in the EMR, it's really very difficult to conceive having to filter through all of that to make clinical decisions. Right. Right. Yeah, I think you know to David's point around that gets back to the burnout and the, the, helping them uh, be more efficient um, in gathering that information, putting it in, in the context of the patient. They don't have to think about it. So the cognitive workload definitely decreases, and then you have more accomplishment as a result. So definitely very much uh, tied to a possible solution to, to bring down some of the symptoms of that burnout. Great. Well, um, I'm glad you chimed in because my, my next question is actually for you. So improvements, as, as David discussed, to the EHR and clinical workflows are all an important step in helping to reduce the burnout. But um, I think, as we all know, that only addresses part of the problem. Right. So I was wondering if you could talk about um, the other ways that Cerner is helping our clients right. um, address the issue. Yeah, I think there's a, a number of things. Uh, first, we'll start on the, the technical side and talk about uh, human factors research and, and usability research. Um, there is a burgeoning field uh, of human computer interactions that uh, we have a team focused on understanding how, how people think in that interaction. And if we understand how they think better, right. um, especially a physician, and a physician and, and other clinicians too, are different um, than say a computer engineer and how they think about it. Um, every time I, I visit our innovations campus and I see guys looking at lines of code and you know, it's very different than what I need to consume and synthesize something right. for them back. Um, you know, we, and that extends to our partnerships with our clients, uh, thinking about how we optimize their efficiency. Uh, we've got tools and the solution, uh, lights on in advance, so we can understand their experience, uh, particularly from a time perspective. Um, the one thing we've, we need to do more of, I think, is um, think about practice redesign. So when you think about how do you uh, give folks a, a, to the ability to work at the top of their license and not necessarily require the physician to do everything, or the nurse for that matter, to do everything. that redesign and rethinking to um, get the most relevant, <laughs> highest quality information to the clinician when they're doing their assessment and, and their treatment um, can be done by a lot of other people. Yeah, that's a great point. So that, that re redesign is, is really important. Then to David's point around turning um, the ergonomics of a room mm -hmm. is very, very important. Um, we are never taught, and, and I'm, I haven't run into a medical school yet, I, I think they should be doing how do you interact with a patient? You know, in your second year of medical school, you learn interview skills. How do you interview a patient with right. a computer in the room too? Mm -hmm. Those basic training, tra actually training somebody um, how to do that mm -hmm. is, is something that we can start to do yeah. as opposed to just assuming it's there and that they'll figure it out. So there's real science there that can be used to, uh, on a number of different fronts, to, to have right. clinicians interact better. Great. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on, um, there's a recent study by um, AMA and MedStar on physician burnout. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I and mean, it's really around usability and yeah. making sure um, that the solution is configured properly. Um, and there's a lot of little things you can do in a clinical workflow to, uh, without writing any new code, mm -hmm. uh, changing some configuration that really gets you to a better experience right up front. So at least, uh, you know, understanding that is, is the first step. They started to do that, comparing. We're 
open to comparing ourselves to others. Um, that's a, you know, <laughs> in a world where IP is everything and, and right. what you develop is really important. Um, that is, uh, I think, different. Yeah. Um, and we, we want to go do that work um, to make sure that we understand what's the best practice out there. Right. Well, you both have shared some wonderful insights with us today. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want to add or just, you know, really add an exclamation point behind? Um, you know, I just think that we are really entering a new era where <clears throat> we're finally starting to see AI capabilities and technologies mature enough to where we believe they're, you know, ready for prime time in certain areas. We also are, you know, we've got the breadth of data that we have now that healthcare is finally you know, digitized from a workflow perspective to where we're seeing the industry shift from you know this area where we were focused on digitizing to now where we're really focused on how can we leverage this data to create not just new insights but new um, intervention opportunities right. so that we can get to a point where you know we're all trying to get to which is um, improving outcomes for patients. Absolutely. And I think data is going to be really the, the driver behind that. So I think it's an exciting an exciting era that we're, we're heading into. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can even say that the, the push from the government, um, while you could argue in the method in which they did it, we are getting to the point where the data elements are there. Mm -hmm. And so now we can do all the smart things that David and his team want to do to help clinicians. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a progression. It's been a difficult progression, obviously, but it's something we can really look forward to. The, the hardest part, I think, is going to be the acceptance on the clinical side. Mm -hmm. David alluded to, you know, the usual it takes 15 years from when something is discovered to get into practice. That paradigm has to change also. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're getting there. The newer generation just knows that AI, machine learning, there's an algorithm and you don't always have to know the details. Um, but I think part of our job will be exposing those details so people can understand really how we got to mm -hmm. the method the behind the madness. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Absolutely. So. Well, thank you both so much. Great. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having us.